It's a pleasure to have this conference. This is the first annual conference in a project called Islam and the Humanities that is beginning this year. Uh, <clears throat> so in a way, it's an inaugural event for the large scale projects that hopefully will go on for a number of years. In the future, the conference will, will be on other topics. This one is the closest to my own work. Hence, I have uh, forced or compelled all of you to be here. Uh, so th thank you for, for that. Um, so the idea of the Islam and the Humanities um, a kind of project is actually to try to compel discussions across different boundaries um, in a way to um, have people who have different parties to come to a single party and then see whether there's an explosion or boredom or something new comes about. Um, so the whole hope is very much that, that we can um, generate a new conversation. And in this context, obviously, it is the connection between um, discussions about theory and philosophy of history um, and the actual work that historians who deal with Islamic materials actually do. And so it, it, it was truly a pleasure to read your papers. Um, that, that have already come in to see that uh, um, that impulse and that invitation was taken up in all seriousness. And um, I'm greatly looking forward to the respondents because I think that will then further the, um, that perspective. Um, so my only job really here is to um, say thank yous to the um, uh, various co-sponsors. So one is, of course, the Islam and the Humanities Project, which is housed within the program in the Middle East Studies here at Brown. So um, uh, my gratitude to the to Middle East Studies and Professor Bashar Dumani, who is not here at the moment, but who has been extremely supportive um, of this project from the beginning. Um, the other co-sponsors uh, at Brown are the Cochrane Institute for the Humanities uh, and the director Amanda Anderson, who was also um, very very supportive from the beginning and. Um, uh, of the project. Um, then we have two departmental uh, co-sponsors, one Department of History um, uh, with the chair, um, Professor Robert Self, and also the Department of Religious Studies, whose chair is Professor Mark Cladis. Um, so one of the, the great pleasures of um, organizing this event at Brown as a part of my introduction to the university as such was to actually suggest this to colleagues and get enthusiastic responses back um, kind of made me confirm my view that it was a good thing that I came here, and that has continued on. And I think this conference itself will, um, will kind of further solidify that. Um, now, I also want to thank, um, especially thank um, some colleagues who are, have come um, from slightly outside of Brown, now too, not too far, which is the editors of the journal History and Theory. Um, I um, uh, wrote to um, Professor Ethan Kleinberg, who's the editor-in-chief of History and Theory, when I was first thinking about this, and he again responded very enthusiastically, and, and, and then we met, and it has been um, it's one of those things where one is thinking the same thoughts in entirely different spheres, and suddenly you have a conversation and think, finally someone I can talk to that I don't have to explain things to. <laughs> so it, it has been a great pleasure working with Ethan and also um, the other editors who are also here. Um, um, Vijay Pinch, Gary Shaw, Matthew Spector, and Laura Stark could not be here. But we are really, truly delighted that the, the way the conference has been organized, how it's arranged, et cetera, was done with feedback from Ethan and others, um, and that we are looking to an afterlife of this conference in the form of uh, special issues of history and theory, um, which is, we hope, is really not just papers presented here, but paper transformed through the discussion that we actually hear. And so and their presence is um, ex greatly appreciated. Um, now, so also, of course, uh, ex hugest thanks to the people who agreed to write the papers, to, to send them in advance, to agree to do this. <laughs> um, and coming from all um, different places, from Europe, from other parts of North America, near and far. Um, really, I'm most grateful for, the, for your accepting the invitation to write the papers, and also especially to the colleagues who are um, the, doing the respond, uh, responses, because they are actually not in the field, the narrowly defined field of Islamic studies. Um, the fact that we um, can have those responses is actually already fulfills the very purpose of the Islam and the Humanities projects and as, we, as we go forward. Advanced thanks to all of the people who are attending from Brown. I think some people are already here. Others will be, I think, coming in, trickling in as the morning cold decreases and people feel warmer to, to come outside. And um, usually this happens at the very end, but I want to actually also begin by thanking Barbara Oberkoto, without whose presence this simply would not happen. Uh, and um, it, it, 
it's a great pleasure to work with her. Um, and whatever happens, I'm sure it will go well because Barbara is here. So she is the person who, uh, with whom I have absolute and total confidence in terms of, the, of this thing working well. So with that, um, I will just invite uh, Professor Melton Toxos, who is the chair of the first panel, and um, we get going. Now, in, in, the, in terms of the panels, uh, the, we are not going to do introductions of the colleagues who are presenting. All that information is on the web. Um, you can go check it there. We will just dive into the material content of the, the intellectual content. So, Melton, please. Thank you. Um, I'm just here to invite the speakers. Uh, and we'll start with the respondent, Helge Ordheim from University of Oslo. The floor is yours. So should I stand or sit? I'm at the moment in my life where I can't see, so I need to figure out if I can see my notes. I can, actually. So thank you so much for being invited to this uh, wonderful conference. And Shahzad said that, uh, well, people who are here are not in the narrow field of Islamic studies. And I think whatever broadly you want to define Islamic studies, I'm not in that field at all. Um, I'm, I'm basically a, a scholar of German historiography and, and, and theories of history. Um, but I take that as a great compliment to be invited and as a great opportunity to, to have discussions with, with scholars who have knowledge of fields that I'm completely uh, ignorant of. Um, and I mean, often you go to conferences where your hopes of learning something are quite low, but in this case, they're really, I have high, high expectations for learning new things at this conference. Um, and also sort of the, the main idea that it's important to get uh, scholars doing sort of European traditions of theories of history to talk to scholars uh, doing non-European historiography seems to be extremely important and valuable. So, um, I mean, to, to um, present someone else's paper um, means uh, I run the risk of misrepresenting it. And, and I apologize for that, and I surely will, but I hope to misrepresent them in interesting ways in that case and prompt a good discussion. Um, and since I go first, I'm, I'm sort of unsure about the tone and the genre and the mode of the presentation, so um, I'll just, I'll just uh, take my chances, I guess. So I'm going to comment on two wonderful papers by Nancy Florida and Judith Pfeiffer. Um, I'll, uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll start start with Nancy's paper, I think, if that's okay. I, I know that there might be some other um, succession, but I, I'll do that. So um, I must admit that there is no limit to what I don't know about Javanese literature. Um, but I've, I've really enjoyed reading the paper, which is beautifully written and argued and uh, brings up something, some really interesting questions in, in thinking about time and, and history. So I'll, I'll have three sets of comments, basically. First, I'll say something about the overall structure of the paper. Then I'll try to formulate some thoughts about what it does with time and history, which is sort of our key questions. Uh, and, and then I'll, I'll uh, and more specifically, about sort of the three dim dimensions of past, present, and future. And then I'll ven venture into some completely unwarranted speculations about history as prophecy at the end. Um, OK, so here we go. So I, I suggest there are basically two ways of conceptualizing the main arguments in this paper, one of which uh, puts, puts more emphasis on the narrative aspects, and the other which would highlight more the philological aspects in the best sense of the word. I'm a big fan of philology in all, all forms and, and shapes. So in the narrative mode, Nancy tells the story of the last of the prophetic court poets of Java, whose name I'm, I'm sure I hopelessly mispronounce, but it's Ronga Varsita? Ronga Varsita. Ronga Varsita. So the A's or O's, basically. Yes. Ronga Varsita. OK. I'll, I'll try to get that right. If I don't, just uh, I'm sorry. 
uh, who lived from 1802 to 1873 and who witnessed firsthand how the traditional Javanese society was overrun by Dutch colonialists and thus a Western modernity after the last stand of the Javanese against Dutch military power had been crushed between 1825 and 1830. The emblem for this story, which opens and closes the essay, is the first Netherlands East Indies Agricultural Congress and Exhibition, staged in the central Javanese city of Surakarta in uh, probably Surakarta. No, that, yeah, I'll, I'll see how it works. In 1873, which ends in disaster when the entire exhibition building burns to the ground, thus offering a, a striking ending to the narrative plot of the paper. So in the philological mode, on the other hand, the essay presents a reading and a quite detailed one of that, uh, of a poem, the most famous poem by Ronga Varsita, A Time of Darkness in Twelve Stances, which he renders, with Nancy renders, in what I understand is her own translation. Um, I'm not able to discuss your choices of translation, of course, but, but uh, it was, was a great read. Uh, not only does this poem qualify as, and I quote, the best known of all Javanese works, it's also taken to be a prophecy. Since its conception, it's been invoked time and again as containing certain prophetic social truths about Javanese society and history, foreseeing the end of the traditional order on Java and the beginning of what the poem refers to as the time of madness, which just has become a phrase and a symbol for a specific way of conceiving of Javanese modern society. So at the intersection between the biographical and the political narrative and the philological reading, something really interesting happens, on which I'm going to spend the rest of my time in the presentation. This has to do with the understanding of time and history and evokes uh, a really interesting way, the already mentioned genre of the prophecy. So this is when I move to the second part of my comments dealing with time and history. So in a sense, the paper starts by sketching the most linear and progressive of all historical narratives. Backdrop for many, or even most papers, I guess, uh, at this, this conference, namely the shift, the transformation, if you like, from tradition, or more precisely from traditional, monarchical, hierarchical, and in a certain sense, feudal society to modernity. Now, obviously, this story of progress is disturbed, and strongly so, by the fact that it happens at the hands of Dutch colonialists against the will of the Japanese people, and is marked by immense brutality and racism. Albeit, such a shift in a normative framework doesn't, as you all know, and I'm sure we'll discuss during these two days a lot, it doesn't in itself change the directionality or the linearity of the historical narrative, only the meaning, or if you like, the teleology is question. So into this strictly linear view of history, Nancy places the genre and the temporal form of the prophecy, the foretelling of the future, with the striking effect that history loses its linearity and starts folding back onto itself. Of course, we could start discussing what folding means in this case, but uh, I won't go there right now, maybe later. So as Ryan Koselek has pointed out, um, the prophecy can be read as a precursor to the modern orientation toward, or rather obsession with, the future, which is then overtaken by other genres and practices such as planning and prognosis. So this sort of shift from prophecy to planning and prognosis is sort of a, a shift that I've come to question, or the continuity between these genres, if you want, is something we can come to question after reading Nancy's paper. Because a future that can be foretold is indeed a very different future from the one that can be planned, to stick with Kozelek's vocabulary. I'll come back to this at the end of the comments. Anyway, in the work of, of Rongo Versita, uh, Nancy argues something very different is going on. He works, and this is a quote, to overcome the rupture of modernity through strategic reinscriptions of past time in ways that have, over the past 145 years, repeatedly elicited recognitions of their effective contemporaneity. And another place he describes how he lived in the in-betweenness in a manner that consciously rejected either uh, embracing Western modernity or being fixed in the dead Japanese tradition. So I'm not in a position to support or challenge this description of the intentionality of the work, I guess in a 
Husserlian in sense. Um, what I find deeply fascinating with the paper, however, is something slightly different, slightly less linked to intentionality, to, to what uh, Ranga Varsita was actually trying to do, and that even in the case of a man who, in the opinion of many readers, foretold his own death, which is sort of an uh, interesting version of intentionality, I guess. Namely, what happens to history when it's exposed to the genre, the mode, and the trope of prophecy? So as a kind of an aside, and in light of the philological interest of the paper, and because we're encouraged to ask questions, obviously, I'd briefly like to ask uh, how Nancy thinks about prophecy in the paper. Is it the genre? Is it the form of future orientation, more anthropological or phenomenological? Is it the religious practice? Is it discursive mode? I guess we can discuss that later on. And prophecy is not only the, the only form of time writing uh, we find in the paper uh, or in, in Rongo Rosita's work, it also contains chronograms, that is sentences in specific letters interpreted as numerals which stand for a particular date when rearranged. So I guess I'm, I'm generally interested in these forms of time writing and how time is written in, in, in the paper and by, by Rongo Rosita. So back to the prophecy. Uh, and the poem and the way it rewrites, re-inscribes the relationship between the three dimensions of time of history, past, present, and future. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to see what the poem does with the present, with the past, and with the future, and, that, and, that, and how, how they're sort of re-described re and, and, and re-conceptualized through the idea of the prophecy. And then I'll try to make some conclusions about that at the end. So I'll start with saying something about the present in the poem and in the paper. So already the 1873 Agricultural Congress, which ends with a disastrous fire in the exhibition building, marks a strong evocation of the present, or rather a certain form of present, uh, which other temporal and political markers are the reform and revitalization of Islam, the reification of Javanese tradition. Uh, tradition is a word we're going to discuss a lot when we get to Nils' papers later on, at the hands of Dutch philologists. Um, as well as the mobilization for the mili military invasion of the Sultanate of Aceh and the general identification of the forces of colon colonial modernity. This is what Ronga Varsita in this poem, in a forceful evocation of the present, or if you feel like of contemporaneity, calls a time of madness, a time at a joint. As Nancy points out, since this is a canonical poem which many Javanese can recite by heart and which has been handed down, through, down in the literary tradition, this time of madness operates like something like a sliding window through which every new generation can recognize the madness of their own time. Thus, the present of the poem generates ever new futures. Already at its conception, however, the poem is in itself the future of a specific past, a prophetic past, so to speak, carefully and I think quite wonderfully excavated by Nancy in the essay. So I'll now move to think about what the past is, the past of prophecy. So because prophecies are directed at the future, they're more or less willful projections of times to come, it's easy to forget that they might in themselves be echoes of the past or repetitions as Nancy calls them, at one point even referring to them as uncanny, thus evoking Freud's theory of das Unheimliche, what is familiar and eerie at the same time, and it's often connected to repetitions. So Ranga Versita's poem is an example of such a repetition in two instances or stages or layers, as it were. Of course, the relationship of the poem to earlier works might meaningfully be discussed in terms of intertextuality or palimpsest. This would, however, however, I think, vastly underplay the complex interconnections of different times of past, presents, and futures, which are work in the text. Hence, I think repetitions works really well in the paper. So if we move chronologically backwards in time, which is what Nancy's doing, even though she wouldn't have to, I think. This takes us to an early 19th century Javanese multi-volume poetic work, a compilation of sorts, often referred to as the first Javanese encyclopedia. 
In this work is contained the 17th century prophecy, which is the inversion of the one found in Ronga Varsita's poem, or rather, obviously, if we follow the chronology of time, his poem is the inversion of this model. In this poem, an ideal, a perfect present is evoked, the opposite of Ronga Varsita's time of madness. The end, however, is only two generations away. In this way, Nan in, in Nancy's word, the older prophecy is turned upside down by Ronga Varsita in his poem. Taking a somewhat different approach, it would be possible to point out that this inversion, temporally speaking, is nothing but a delay. In the second poem, the end is already here. In the first, it hasn't arrived yet. Of course, that again depends on what kind of historicity, what kind of past, present, future nexus, to use our talk terms, we're dealing with here. Was that sort of a... Uh, Sorry. And there, should that remind me of anything? Uh, Not yet. Not yet, OK. You have about seven minutes. Oh, that's perfect. Oh, so I, ha I have to do the both papers in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Ah. It's OK, we can adjust. OK, okay I, thought, I thought we had 15 minutes. Pro OK, then I misunderstood the, the brief. OK, OK, he says it's fine. I listened to him, sorry. I, did, I didn't get this. I, I really thought I had 15 minutes per, per paper. OK, uh, so I'll do, I'll talk about this paper for a uh, well, three, four, five more minutes, and then I'll move on. Um, um, right. So, moving backwards in time, further into the past, uh, if you like, we come to the second instance stage, or second layer of repetition, or rather the first, if you think of them as forming a historical trajectory. Um, and I like to quote the sentence from Nancy's essay at this point, because I, I think it's absolutely beautiful and intriguing, and not sure really what it means. So she writes, but the full prophetic force of Ronga Varsita's iteration of the prophetic past is only realized in his reinscription of another prophecy, one that traces Javanese history backwards and forwards from year zero to judgment day, and thus so, so with an explicit Islamic framework. So this prophecy is called the Jaibaya prophecy. It's found in the same multi-volume encyclopedic work, where it's told that it was composed in the ninth century uh, after it was revealed to King Jaibaya by a wandering Islamic saint from Turkey. Turkey. S right, so in her essay, Nancy renders the complete text of this prophecy and thus leaves it up to any reader, even those completely unknowledgeable of Javanese literature, like me, to recognize that the first seven stanzas is a more or less verbatim repetition of the stanzas we'd already read in Ronga Versita's poem. And again, it's important to remember that the time of reading is not necessarily in sync with the time of history, as we're moving forwards towards the end of the, pa the paper, we're moving backwards in history toward the beginning. So the Jaibaya prophecy laments the coming of the time of darkness, of blindness, and of wrath. When Ronga Varsita repeats these words and phrases, this time has arrived. The past future has become the present. Or in other words, the present is transformed into the future of a specific, rather glorious past. What then about Ron Grover his own future, the future of his own colonial present, marking the end of tradition and the beginning of modernity? Does that present, after it has been turned into the bleak future of an earlier glorious present, in itself have a future? Or put in Kozelek's terms, so far, we've been discussing futures past, vergangene Zukunft. Now we turn to future futures. So this brings me sort of to my last point. I'll try to be kind of quick about this. Um, so the last part of the essay leading up to the conclusion is a close reading of certain passages of the poem in which Nancy tries to show how Ronga Varsita shifts from a description of his own decline and imminent death, as well as his position as someone who is out of sync with his time, out of sync is my phrase, if you don't like it, we can discuss it, into what Nancy labels the prophetic register of Islam, in which ethical imperatives are linked to a certain form of remembrance of God, but also of the human past, lives and deeds which can serve as models for the future. In other words, Ronga Varsita's present also has a future beyond the disasters of colonialism and Western modernity and beyond his own death, kept alive by the ethical imperatives of Islam. Okay, I'll just conclude with some speculations about 
prophecy in history. Uh, so, so basically, uh, Nancy responds to the question what prophecy does by saying that it communicates an ethical message, it has an, an ethical force, made possible by a specific way of connecting past and futures, creating what she calls a relay across discontinuous times. We can discuss this word relay if you want. However, what the essay is also doing, what I find extremely interesting, is that it installs prophecy at the heart of history as an organizing concept or a genre, not unlike the way we like to think about progress. The essay invites us, or at least me, to speculate. What if the temporal order of history wasn't progress, but prophecy? What would be the implications? And this is really pure speculations, and, and you might feel free to ignore this as ramblings, but I, I'll do them anyway. So firstly, history as prophecy would always have to be understood backwards. Since every present and every future is nothing but the realization of a past prophetic vision or word, history would still move forward, but meaning would be found in the past. Second, it would, as Nancy has pointed out, be a history of repetitions and delays, some of them rather uncanny, since always hard, often impossible, to know if a prophecy is fulfilled or not, and what that fulfillment would look like. Thirdly, and finally, and just as uh, Erich Auerbach showed in his article on the figura, and Benjamin in his thesis, prophecy, in a very different way than progress, would revolve around, highlight, invest meaning and potential in the present as a moment and event in its own right, not just an effect of the past or a cause of the future in a kind of linear progression. The prophetic moment can be foretold and foreseen, imbued with providential meaning and ethical force, but can hardly be planned or controlled. Well, then again, maybe it can. So that was uh, what I had to say about, about Nancy's paper, and I'll move to talk about Judith's that I got only yesterday, so I must admit I didn't have as much time to read and, and <coughs> reflect on it, but uh, I think it's a, it's a wonderfully interesting paper, and especially uh, the, the way it invokes sort of the, the genre of universal history and uh, the idea of parallel histories, which I find as, is, is, is a wonderful phrase also because it evokes the wonderfully unreadable work by Petr Nadas with that same title. Um, and it, it sort of goes into my own thinking about uh, what I try to call synchronism. So synchronism in, in early modern European history seems to be very closely related to the idea of, of parallel histories. So that's uh, what I'm going to talk briefly about. I'm just going to point to the fact that it's interesting that both these papers have authors and works uh, at their center. And I think that's something we can discuss later on, why and to what extent this kind of discussing uh, Islamic pasts and, and time in history has prompted so many of you to choose authors and works. I mean, it, this could be done in other ways, but that's sort of been the way that many of the papers, at least at the conferences, proceeding that I think is interesting. So in Judith's case, the author is Rashid al-Din. Um, the working question, which will be familiar to most, if not all of you, is, uh, and I, I will mispronounce the Arabic, Jami al-Tawarik, or a compendium of chronicles, often referred to as the first universal or world history, Judith can, tells us. Um, I guess there are a few others being competition for this title, obviously, like a Eurocentrist like myself, Eusebius and Polybius comes to mind, but that's sort of the point to discuss what universal history means in this context. And uh, Judith's point is to, to, to argue that this is not a universalistic work, but a pluralistic one that tells parallel history is not one integrated big history. So uh, just to be Quick, as many of you will know, Rashid al-Din was an early 14th century historian, statesman and intellectual. Uh, from being a court physician, he rose to become the top vizier of the Mongol state in the Middle East, known as the Elkinate, um, extending over much of the territory of today's Iran, Iraq, and parts of Anatolia, Syria, the Caucasus, Turkmenistan, and Afghanistan. This is what Judith tells us. Um, 
He was also commissioned as a court historian before he was executed in 1318 um, under the suspicion of having poisoned the father of the then Ilkhan. But before he, uh, he was executed, he managed to write, or rather to compile, a 12-volume vol 12 work of history commissioned by the Mongol ruler. It set out as a history of the Mongol state, but then, and again, by commission by the ruler, was expanded to include all other people which were or could become in connection with the Mongol state, and since their claim to power was universal, so was the history. At least that's one way to put it. So in the first part of the paper, Judith raises several questions regarding the philological groundwork necessary to know what kind of text we're dealing with. I'm not going to go into the details, um, but those who are interested will, will know and appreciate that she takes the time to share with her readers all these, these philological details of, of the material she's working with. Um, and I'll just drop this for the sake of brevity. Um, and move into this part. So, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm comment on, my, and I, I'm, I'm gonna cut a bit from the, 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 the comment. That's why I'm getting kind of confused. But I'm gonna comment on three topics uh, from the paper: the practice of writing history the relationship between history and time, uh, chronology, if you want, and finally, the attempt to bring Rashid al-Din into conversation with more recent theory. Um, so i first like to address the practice of writing history, uh, what Rashid al-Din is actually doing and how Judith sees this. As already pointed out, he's gathering, compiling, quoting, and putting histories of different people alongside each other, in parallel much like in the so-called synchronistic tables, which are much used in the Western tradition later on. How this is actually done in Rashid al-Din's compendium, it's not quite clear to me. I mean, practically, how does he avoid linearity and thus the intrinsic linear chronology of writing uh, one event after the other? Does, does he use tables, images, columns, phrases like meanwhile at another place? Does he use chronology? In that case, in what way, since it does seem like he's synchronizing different chronologies, uh, is he, why is he not introducing some kind of universal periodization? Um, another way to ask the same question would be to say, uh, when, when Judith says that Rashid al-Din tries, and I quote, to incorporate and explain genealogical thinking, people being linked in time vertically through genealogies, dynasties, and the like, when he as Judith also puts it, was integrating them into a single narrative framework, projecting the impression of unity. How does that happen? I ask this partly because I find it hard in my own work with 18th and 17th and 18th century German historiographers to be sure whether they're telling parallel histories, allowing for plurality, multiplicity, or if they're actually trying to synchronize all these different stories into one narrative framework. It's hard to say often, I find. So the question seems to be related to uh, his own, uh, Rashid al-Din's own description of his history and the preface, I think, not as universal, but as perfect. How does moving from single histories to parallel histories represent perfection? I'm interested in how you see this. In connection with the practice of writing and tying into the question of perfection, I also want to ask you about another thing, and this goes to what Margaret Pernau is working on, namely the emotional and effective economy of writing history. On page 17, you write that Rashid al-Din was not defying periodization, but just calmly accepted and appreciated it as an heuristic tool to understand the past and present of various people. So I guess what interested me here is the word calmly. What do you mean by it, and why is it important? And I ask because it, it keeps returning equally calmly and poisedly, you're right, he tells us that the inhabitants of China were idol worshippers. And just before, he has laconically stated that the Jews organized their history in three eras. And further out, out you write, in Jamil al Tavarik, Rashid al-Din very calmly and almost in a detached man manner develops a theory of historiography that stands abo above and outside of periodization without giving up the notions of deep time. 
This permits him to narrate quite calmly the various attempts at periodization by various people, etc. So what is it about this calmness? Is it the virtue for an historian to be calm? And calm in what way? Is that unengaged, laconic? What would an uncalm historian be like? Annoyed, aroused, engaged? Or is it post-Western theory of history that is uncalm, slightly manic, highly strung in overdrive, so to speak? Basically, basically I think that the emotional economy of history writing is a very interesting, though what's somewhat understated part of the argument of the paper. So the second point, and I'm, I'm really getting to the end, it's a much shorter one, um, the, the paper contains a wonderful and really, really illuminating discussion of the different calendars that are at work in Rashid Aldin's compendium. The solar calendar, the lunar calendar, the lunisolar Chinese 12 animal calendar, the Greek era, the cyclical time of India history, etc. In this way, you argue Rashid Aldin uh, lets each narrator tell his people's history in his own terms, with his own calendar. In his own work, in his, in his, in his life, Rashid Aldin was exposed to and exposed his readers to what you, with a sort of Bactinian phrase, call a diglossia of time, a polychronia. And, and Judith concludes with a striking phrase, Rashid Aldin did not have to come up with a theory of multiple temporalities, he was already living it. Again, looking at this from the Western tradition and the Christian competence, um, the striking thing is that he didn't try to synchronize these different times and come up with a workable common chronology. So I guess I'm, I'm just curious why he didn't. And then I'm curious what you mean when you write later on that without explicitly explaining it as his method, uh, we can, but we can deduce it from his practice, Rashid al-Din used the method of calculating the time elapsed according to the narrative of each people in order to understand roughly where their past actually tallied and where they were and were not in sync with each other. Does that mean that he was constructing a common chronology after all? And it sort of raises the questions of the relationship between history and chronology. Towards the end of the paper you write with reference to Kozelek and, and to my reading of him, that by organizing his history in the way he did, Rashid al-Din actually did nothing else but address the different layers of conceptual meaning with different chronological origins, or the synchronicity of the non-synchronous, the Gleitzeitigkeit und Gleitzeitig. Only he did it untheorized, calmly, laconically maybe, and based on practice. So I guess my question is how you see synchronicity and the synchronous in this phrase and how it relates to the relationship between calendaric chronological time and history. What in this expression is time and what is history? Um, and that's my last point now. So at the end of the paper you invite uh, me and others, other people who work with theory in the sense it's been coined and developed in, in a European context to engage with non-European writers who might not be theorists in the sense prescribed by this tradition, but still make important contribution to development of historiography, uh, also on a more abstract level. And which is an invitation that I'm more than happy to accept. Um, and in, in a lot of my own work, I've tried to establish dialogues between recent theorists of history and 17th and 18th century historiography, exactly for the same reason that you hint at. Uh, that they have a better, more practical, methodological understanding of what work with multiple temporalities in history might mean. But my experience is that people often get confused when you mix arguments and names they identify as theory with arguments and names which they think of as historical, as objects of study more than theories in their own right. So at moments when you use Rashid al-Din with and against Koselik, I suddenly find myself having much of the same response. So I wondered how you how we could reflect together a bit about how of the preconditions and frameworks for that kind of a dialogue that I think is really interesting. Sorry for being so long, but that's it. Is my here? Yeah. Yes, please. I think you you may be forgiven according to Shehzad, because you were the first person to go on. But we have to finish at yeah, 11, which gives an, an, an hour. 
so when I invite our um, paper writers to respond to Helge, I'm going to have to remind them that they have about 10 minutes to do so, maybe a little bit more. So we have half an hour for discussion. So if we finish with your um, responses before 10.25 or so, I'll let you know as time goes by. That'd be great. Um, so I think we should go in the order that uh, you spoke. So um, we, we, I will invite Nancy Florida to, to come to the floor to respond. Thank you. Would you like to sit? Um, yeah. You can, yeah. sure. <laughs> the mic works, right? Okay. <clears throat> okay. First, first, I want to thank Helga. That was, you know, a wonderful reading, and uh, uh, you know, I'd, I would would love to, have, in a sense, co-author this paper with you because I think I think that you brought up. Uh, you know, a lot of points, you brought forward a lot of points that I was trying to, mm -hmm. to, to work with, but you did it in a, in a way that was much more intelligible in some ways. So, um, you ask, uh, and I'm, I'm more of a writer than a speaker, so I may be uh, brief, I may not go for my 10 minutes, but I'll try to answer some of your questions. Um, and I think one of the, main questions you asked was history and prophecy, the question of, of, of the intersection of history and prophecy and thinking of history as prophetic rather than progressive. Right. Okay, so this, this I think is actually really, really central to the way history uh, is written in the Javanese context. So in, in the, what we might call, and I don't want to call, but we, you know, the traditional Javanese context. Um, there's a sense in, and it has a very, uh, you know, broad and, and deep historiographical tradition. Um, history for the, 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 the 18th, 19th century uh, Javanese historian who was writing and sung poetry was something that was alive, something that, that the past was alive, the past was not dead, okay? Um, and the past lived in the present and was always structured towards the future. And it was structured towards the future in any specific present in which a historian was writing. Now, one of the ways you can see this, I think, is that you have this like, you know, very uh, you know, rich his historiographical tradition without any secondary commentary. So no, no one comes in and, and writes about someone else's writing of history. There, there is no commentary tradition at all, zero. So what you get in these historians is rather than a secondary commentary is, and it doesn't mean they were reading each other's works and works in the past, but you know, coming up say in a moment of danger, a flash of danger, reading the past, reading someone else's uh, writing of the past and rewriting it in that moment of danger. Okay, so bringing alive that past uh, and and changing it. I mean, if, if you do you know close readings, you can find you can find those moments when things shift, and doing that in order to and I, I'm thinking of Margaret's work to uh, and sometimes to produce a warning, and warning is a, a, a you the word for warning is also the word for remembrance. Okay, so you produce a warning in your present that projects into the future, but it, the, the foretold future is not usually, except for in the case of, say, Ronga Wasito uh, predicting that I'm gonna die on such and such date. It's not exactly what's going to happen, but it's projecting shapes of, of future, and even projecting, suggesting in the warning and the remembrance of the past, uh, uh, better shapes for the future, right? So looking at one's present, living in one's present, living one's present, you know, rising up in a moment of danger, a past appears, a past doesn't only appear, a past is 
lives in the present, and that past also is projected into the future in the way that the historian reworks it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I think of prophecy as, uh, as I guess it's a discursive mode in this way. Right? right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the writing of history, and, and actually my, my book is, uh, the, I think the subtitle is <sighs> History is Prophecy. Okay. Oh, <laughs> so, it is. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> yes, I thought that's funny. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, one, one, one writes history in order to produce a future, okay, discursively. And produce, uh, and often it's written in a moment, it, it's, or at least the things that, that I'm excited by are written in moments of danger. Okay, so moments of danger that look forward to times of madness, you know, ways out, okay? But not the way out, you know, horizons, possible horizons, or a horizon that east, at least recognizes the warning, the remembrance of the now, which has gotten screwed up and how, how it got screwed up, okay? Um, chronograms, chronograms are big. Uh, uh, Chronograms, not all dates are written chronograms, but uh, particularly uh, charged moments in time are written in chronograms, okay? And, and the chronograms are not random. They they're, they're also have discursive meaning. I'm thinking of, of one, it was a, uh, something in f fanged, uh, Fanged monster, uh, uh, fanged monster, and and reflective saint, which was used to uh, uh, to record the meeting between uh, a Javanese king in the early 19th century and uh, Herman William Daniels, who was a you know particularly brutal uh, colonialist, and this was a you know a a, a moment a charged moment, a moment of danger, and it actually, you know, sort of describes who was there. It doesn't say that the, it's, it's uh, this is not in a, a long discursive history, but, uh, you know, a short collection of dates. That was one, that was one of my favorites. But, but yeah. most of the cardigans actually say something like this. Are they sort of mnemotechnical? They're supposed to help you remember? Is that why they're, or what's, the, what's their function? What is their function? They're, I think their function, I mean, I can't really say, you know, why, why um, but it's to mark a moment as charged, as, impo as an important moment, okay? Um, they don't necessarily help one remember, um, in part because they're, uh, they're, it would only be a, an elite crowd that would be able to remember because knowing which numerals go with which uh, which words? Mm -hmm. So it's you know, s for instance, sevens are usually sages because there's seven mountains, and fire is three because there's a, a, a Sanskrit word that also means fire and three. But mm -hmm. anything that has to do with fire, anything that has to do with vision is two because we have two eyes. So, so but you have to, you know, anything that has to do with the, the sky is uh, zero, kings are one, God is one. <laughs> so, but, but you have to sort of know, know this whole structure and most people didn't know it and nowadays hardly anybody knows it. So, um, I don't know, writing time, so do you have a sense of what the function might be? I mean, you, you're reading of, <laughs> I haven't actually really, really thought about it. But I don't think it's a, a, a mnemonic device no. because you'll get like these, you know, really, really long and intricate datings. Uh, and this is interesting for you in terms of the synchronicity. Syn <laughs> syn synchronism. 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 In in Java, also there are multiple calendars, so you might have a dating and of. Uh, of a writing or of an event, and it will say, according to this calendar, it was on the 5th of June, blah, 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 or the 6th, pardon? 
<laughs> the third of, of Shabal, and then it would go through all of these things, but, but uh, it would go at, at 6 o'clock in the morning on a Wednesday in, in the uh, market week of such and such, right? And it would go through all of these things, that, you know, really writing it out. And then it, but it would give the year in chronogram, which in a sense more obscures, because it's gone through this, this long, intricate dating uh, in, in numbers before that, okay? Uh -huh. And the important times, and I thought this was, and I mentioned this to you, in, in Java are the times where um, calendars intersect. Okay, so if you look at, a, at, at an older Javanese calendar, it's, it's wheels, the wheels turn in different ways. So the important point, say, in your life would be the fifth, when the 5th of June crosses with the 4th of Shawal. And that's flash, that's a flash, of, that's a moment when these things, when things come together in a line. And the, the, the big ones are only uh, on the, the, your 32nd birthday by the Javanese year and your 64th birthday. Those are big, almost everything lines up. And that's in the lunar, in the lunar calendar. But, but, it ha but it's where things cross, where things intersect. So if you ask me what my birthday is, my birthday is, is not the 29th of December, but it's Thursday pying. So it's Thursday crossing with, with the, uh, the other calendrical cycle, pying. Yeah, so. And many Javanese don't know their year birthday. What they know is that crossing. Okay. Um, anything else that I can? Uh, oh, I I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So now I'll invite um, Joseph Piper to come to the floor. If you want, you can sit as well, and then we'll just continue from there. Okay. However you wish. You can stay there. You okay. Thank you very much, and um, I have to start with an apology to you as to my own, uh, well, <coughs> what should I say? It's me who is missing out, we're all missing out by not hearing a, a, a proper, um, uh, you know, response with more time. I'm sorry for sending it to you so late. Um, uh, I had a concatenation of unpredictable issues in the family, including um, a death. Um, yeah. Uh, I should also start out with saying that I, when I uh, wrote my paper, it was very much um, infused by what um, what Shahzad Bashir has done, uh, uh, his paper on, on periodization, which I also had the, uh, the privilege to um, listen to in person while it was in the making and uh, interact with him and hear from him what 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 he thought about it. And so, what um, his paper is, it's a it's a plaidoyer. Um, for um, a, a, a reorientation of the foundational uh, text of Islamic historiography. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was trying to do. Right. So if I wanted to look for Ungleichzeitigkeit in Rashid team, mm -hmm. that would be very easy. I could take the exact text that um, is in, uh, that, I, that I have here in the paper where he um, talks about uh, the, the making of the history. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, in it he, he, he says, well, I'm taking the um, the, let's say, widely spread traditions of each narrator of each different tradition. Okay, so the word he's using, mutawatir, um, comes out of the Islamic hadith transmission uh, 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 vocabulary. So here he is, on the one hand, claiming that he is um, uh, unengaged, he is just narrating what <coughs> each person is saying, but he's using the terminology of Islam. I'm saying it's a history written by a Muslim for Muslims, where he was a Muslim, but he was a convert from Judaism to Islam. The Muslims for whom he wrote it are the Mongol converts from Buddhism to Islam, do they even understand that when he uses this mutawatir that it's coming from them? And he himself did not grow up properly in this, bless you, in this tradition because he also says in his theoretical works um, that he um, did not have the time in his youth to actually attend schools because he was working immediately um, and did not go through the Islamic um, education. He didn't go to a madrasa and he regrets that um, uh, severely. So we can 
uh, find all of that in those texts. If we want to think in a framework that was already made for us by European historians for a European historiography, who all have a baggage which by reading the papers um, around the table here, especially um, um, Nancy's and Margaret's, um, they are carrying the same baggage that some of us have and that also Kozelik was, was carrying. So for instance, we have somebody in the German uh, German uh, tradition, um, uh, Schiller, who uh, did his Antrittsvorlesung, the first lecture that he did at the University of Jena in the late 18th century. He asked the question, what is and for which end or which purpose do we study or does one study universal history? Um, so, uh, für welches was ist und für welches Ende studiert man Universalgeschichte? That was a question that he gave his first lecture about when he became a professor of history in Jena, right? And what he does is, on the one hand, he kinds of you know kicks a, kicks against the Brotgelehrte, people who just work in universities and don't have any um, any you know any ethics as a historian, people who make them they earn their bread with it, but they are not intellectuals. And the other big part of it is he is actually one of these, um, you know, as they all baggage, of that linearity of history. He has um, in his Universal Geschichte other peoples in his mind who live in different um, geographies, their neighbors, but they are on the timeline of progress sure. the people who came before we came, and everything leads up to me, Schiller. Um, uh, living in the world, uh, the pin on the pinnacle of progress and civilization and knowledge and you know all the good things. So basically, then I come back. If um, uh, for instance the question of why didn't Rashid Jean have you know established synchronicity? In a sense, it's an anachronism to us that because um, or it's it's let's say it's we have a, a, a tick list of what he could have done or what he should have done. My question is not to come with this baggage or come with the framework sure. and to kind of work down the points, but rather to see what were the methods that um, the historians, um, Muslim historians of various backgrounds, um, came up with themselves. Um, hence the long philological explanations yeah. about what, how he conceived his history. He says history is actually for him, his history consists of four parts. And that's a mistake that also many Islamic historians, my colleagues, our colleagues, make, and I thought at the beginning when I started working on him, that his history is history, narrative history, text. And he's known as his first world historian, he, well, he worked on the Mongols, he wrote the history of the Mongols, and he wrote the histories of the people who were, <coughs> people who were then known. So he has the Chinese in there, he has the uh, Franks in there, he has a list of the popes in there, he has the Jewish patriarchs in there, he has the Turks with Osman, etc. in there. So he's all the people, peoples in India, etc that he thought um, he needed uh, uh, to mention. Okay, so we have these, these, these two parts, and that's what people normally <coughs> look at, and that's what was translated early on um, uh, in France, uh, you know, when people were interested precisely in Alexander and Genghis Khan and that, uh, these things. So we have a very exact um, uh, the, um, Alexander Schlacht uh, parallel in terms of how one can read it, um, even with, with a painting, with a, a large miniature that one could do. So he's doing that, but he's also adding, and let's here come to the question that you asked, so how is he doing this? How does he achieve this unity? He adds two other dimensions, and they're actually expressed visually, not in a narrative. But he also says explicitly that they're part of it, and they're geography. He was planning to make maps of the world, um, uh, and he actually, in his long um, uh, endowment deed that has survived, has been edited, etc. So 400 uh, pages long, he explains to us how he had the paper made that was large enough to have those maps made. And when he saw the beautiful paper, he said, oh, I want all my works on that. If you go to Paris to the Bibliothèque Nationale, you have manuscripts that are as large as half of this thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so he had this, uh, the geography uh, planned. We have no maps that have survived, so my great chakra. Uh, and genealogy, the peoples um, who make up this world and how they are interconnected. That's of course produced in a context in which his own patrons, the Mongols, were very, very heavily invested in uh, genealogy. That's, you know, anthropologists will tell you they are totally exogamous. They need nine generations of uh, people outside of the family before they can actually marry to somebody. So that's a clash, of course, with Islam when they come where you have cousin marriage, which the one has to do with, with nomadism, the other one has to do with. Um, you know, with, with, with uh, working on land. I mean, there's all kinds of economical <laughs> questions um, behind that. 
So he has um, genealogy as one of the important parts of how he organizes um, the world, how he sees the world, and that's also, and he names it the Shuabe Panjgana, the five-fold history, the five branches of history, so to speak. So rather than thinking in terms of um, climbs, which is already there, the, you know, he has also a Greek her heritage to the Islamic um, ways of thinking about the world, he also adds the people. And then he comes with a theory of, of history, which he says, it's based on some ancient books that he claims he, he found. It's, it's not Quranic, I've checked it. It says, um, The first thing that God created were the heavens and earth. And then he comes up with his theory, and he tells you that's the perfect history. Tarikh Tam, Tarikh Tam. So he says the, the, the complete, the, the most um, uh, you know, established, the most perfect history is the one that is built on these words. So what do you expect from somebody in the early 14th century? Of course it has some kind of um, uh, you know, divine, scriptural based, etc. foundation. And so that foundation for him is, you have four parts. Awal, first, stands for time, zaman. Then he says, ma khalaqa, that which created, subject missing word, that which God created. So created is a fiat, a word. This is where action comes in, um, motion, etc. And that goes back to the kind of philosophical and kalam works that you have at that time in, in Islam where they really, really, very really heavily go on motion and what is actually a moment there. We have the present. How, f how finely can you, can you kind of cut that down into different um, you know, pieces so that you come to that moment? Because they know it's, it's a dead to the future, right? Every yes, every now is already a past. Um, and then, awwal ma khalaqa, Allah, that's ism, that's a noun, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, um, a nomen as well. So um, that's the people who act. Um, uh, and then, as wal well, art, this is the, the um, heavens and earth, that, that's your place, that's Makan. So he has Zaman, time, he has Makan for, for a place, and he has Khalaqa for the kind of fear, for action, for motion, Haraka, um, uh, and he has, has um, of course, uh, the, the people who are, who are in that. And so those four parts for him, based on um, a, a, you know, a, let's say, a, a divine uh, proposition, he then grafts on his history. And his history is made of four parts. And one of those parts are the genealogies, people. And one of them is also um, Macan, the, the uh, geography. And he makes that really into a theory. Well, if I go and, and um, say, mm, where is that in Kozelik? Well, it's difficult. You know, we have to let these sources speak yeah. in their own terms Absolutely. and see what kind of theory they come up with. And we have to follow them to a certain extent. Um, and uh, I, I certainly think that this is some kind of theory. In terms of synchronicity, how does he bring it together? I said he is, um, he is letting them uh, evolve in parallel. They can um, evolve in their own times. Um, uh, on the one hand, Rashid al-Din himself had to deal with these times, both when he was writing history and when he was dating things and when he was talking about other people with their other uh, calendars. Um, so that's, uh, that's uh, the one thing. But in the history, how does he bring it together? He doesn't make any tables, even though table, the table format was very, very common at that time. You know, you have tables about medicine, Galenic medicine put up in, um, you know, how hot and how wet, etc. foods are. He doesn't go for the table format. Um, uh, on the one hand, I think, uh, he doesn't say that explicitly or I haven't seen it. On the one hand, I think because history is not just about time, history is about a message that you convey, so it's not necessarily important that you that you date everything correctly, but what is actually um, the thing that we can learn from history, and here we come back to the folding back on, you know, former history, informing the future. Um, uh, and um, so that's, that's, that's the one thing. Um, he doesn't need um, tables, because he always gives, gives a fi fixed, um, uh, fixed, point in history, which is related to the Hijri calendar. Mm. So um, you don't then have to have all the other parallels. And some of them are not, not linear histories, right? I mean, he's, he says there's, there's adwar, there are eons of, of, of um, circular history. So how do you do that, really? Uh, so there <coughs> is one standard calendar. That not a you, calendar. Everything else is kind of. Chronology. It's one, yes. Okay. And that's actually interesting, the one that is not the, uh, the, the solar calendar that we are 
um, used to and that goes with the seasons, but it's actually the lunar calendar, which is a really abstract calendar because it only just follows time, of the time, you know, the, the moon, but not the kind of seasons that we experience. So he has a reference point in history, not a, uh, a synchronicity for everything. Finally, coming to the calm, and then I shut up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, why calm? Uh, I've also brought in a couple of, of um, examples. Maybe they're not strong enough. But basically, he says, I'm saying that I have this principle of writing history as letting each narrator, who is the most, um, uh, the most trusted narrator for each of these traditions that I now hear re-narrate, re <coughs> speak for themselves, and the responsibility is on the narrator of the other tradition. Um, because otherwise we can't have any history if I always doubt and think about what is correct and what is not correct. Um, but he says, please, nobody should accuse me of unbelief just because I'm talking about Buddhists in their own terms and you know people thinking about eons in their own terms and Tanas or uh, migration of souls in their own terms, etc. And this is written, of course, in a context in which you have polemics, religious com polemics. Mm. And he is very, very, he tries to be really distanced from that <coughs> and let, let each person speak in their own terms. Now, um, he doesn't have the baggage of Schiller. He doesn't have, he doesn't need to react to these things. He doesn't, you know, he's not a modern, but he, I think he did, he did develop a theory of yeah. historiography in his own terms. And that's what I was trying to bring yeah, out. Yeah. And, and wonderfully, wonderfully so. Yeah, definitely. Can, can I just say one thing? Of course. Uh, because it's sure. interesting that this, this discussion is a discussion that moves across times and across geographies yes. in itself, right? So, uh, and, I, and I think, so my point would rather be to say that, uh, well, why Schiller? I mean, <laughs> universal history has existed also in the European context for 2,000 years before Schiller. So, I mean, saying that universal, that tradition of universal history uh, revolves around Schiller, who's sort of a... a who establishes a certain form of philosophical universal history that is very different from the tradition that you see sort of in the medieval and early modern tradition that sort of ends and, and culminates with Gutter, maybe, right? So it's, it's something about that, that kind of, uh, that theoretical baggage that Koselek is working with has sort of also a counterpoint in the, in the European tradition it's, itself because it has to do with what... Of course. Was going on of course, I mean, yeah. Sheila has yeah. his predecessors. Sheila is responding to the, this big British. Um, I mean, I was actually very much um, when I read uh, your and um, where is where is Margaret sitting? I don't even know. Really. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> great paper. Um, when I was both of you, uh, when I when I when I read those, I I thought, I mean, oh God, these guys are are just influenced by and renating. I mean, we have also people going back, but we have people who are kind of living in the same environment. So when Schiller, for instance, it can be others. It, you know, I think there's a whole web, of course, of other people who, who also wrote in that mode. And they're, you know, mm -hmm. um, <coughs> as an example, because his was a reaction to a large enterprise by, um, uh, by, by English historians first, but then there was all kinds of crisscrossing translations, reactions, etc., etc., in Europe at that time. Um, that was called universal history, and um, and of course that was p something that was in part necessitated or a response to um, uh, basically colonialism, right? And um, this whole narrative about uh, the present of people in the colonies. I'm not just really kind of making it really uh, in very rude terms. I'm just saying it crude terms. Um, the <laughs> Do that. The I'm, I'm sorry. The history of the. You want some water? Yeah, it's okay. The history of the, um, or the present of the people in the colonies is the past of the people who rule those colonies. That's basically what the universal history of. I mean, he's talking about De Wilden, et etc. et cetera. I mean, if you read Schiller today, he's totally politically incorrect. Um, but I think he was part of a larger narrative. Could be somebody else. But the same kinds of things that I see when, when, when people say, oh, we, have, we need taraqi and we need to think about this, and how can we possibly even think about Islam as a way to think about time um, and where we stand today sure. uh, is very much part of that same narrative. I think this I will think. be a topic to d converse about yes, the whole two also. days, so it would be best sure. to stop here and sure. open it to, <coughs> to the, yes. Um, I'll go by that order, and I uh, I know Nancy. Please, I'll collect some questions, and then yeah.
Okay. Oh, Next yeah. question. No, we'll collect questions. Yes, please. But they should be all the panel ones should also be on. Go on, go on. Something up with the mics. The notion of progress then, sorry, <laughs> is then I think in some ways um, usefully on or take or just or blown up, and maybe prophecy is something that's more valuable. Mm. Thought. Okay. Next Good question. 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 I saw a hand there. Please go ahead. Um, I have two questions, one for each. If I may. Go ahead. Just quickly. Um, <laughs> I, I, I try to be quick. All right. Um, I try to figure out whether I understood the paper correctly and um, um, and the speakers. Um, you, Judith, stressed very much the um, plurality of this history and the desire by the author to shift responsibility onto the shoulders of the reporters. And I was wondering if, according to the uh, text that you quoted from him on pages 10 and 11, one can say that this is a little bit more than that. Because in the first place, he, he um, refers to everyone. As a matter of course, everyone. That's universal. If I, I don't know the original, obviously, but in English, it's universal. Mm -hmm. Everyone recounts a thing as it has come to him through uninterrupted tradition or as he has heard it. And it often happens that a transmitter adds to or subtracts from his report. And if they don't absolutely lie, then they color their expression. So that's the first point. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you could call that a situated universality or a negative universality, but it's universal. Everyone reports things from their own perspective, number one. Why can you do that calmly? Because he then goes on and he says, the implementation of the divine way is as has been mentioned. And human nature has been fashioned in this manner. So anyone who thinks he can report otherwise, such as historians of our universal kind of history, is <coughs> muddle-headed and wrong thinking. That's the wrong way to go about world history. He's calm the way I understand this. I don't want to know whether this makes sense to you. He is calm <coughs> because it's the divine way for people to have different perspectives in different places, and you stick to your own, which is certainly what he does, and everybody else sticks to theirs, because it's natural that this will be subject to controversy, and that is how you serve the generality of people. I was wondering what that concept is, the generality of people that's clearly not just one group that's reporting. That's, um, you know, what is it, 10 lines, 15 lines from the top on page 11. Are we if you done? want to benefit the generality of people, Sorry. then you have to do that. Okay, we're coming to the second question, and that's about prophecy. I think it is important to distinguish between prophecy and history and between predictions, as economists make, which are often, often turn out to be false, but which are not prophecy. Uh, you said, Nancy, that um, the foretold future is not exactly what is going to happen. And I think that does not mean that the prophecy is false, because the prophecy does not intend to tell exactly what is going to happen. And then you said, does that make sense? And people sort of mumbled and nodded. And I'm not sure how much sense it actually does make to us, an audience like this, because we are deeply used to separating prophecy from history. It's already in the Bible, history, the historical books, the prophetic books. If we want to have a model of prophecy, and this just struck me as I was listening to the paper, I hadn't thought of it before, then I would go to something like the second coming. 
that famous poem that everybody knows by William Butler Yeats. That's a prophecy. And it's an inverted prophecy. And I've got to read this, if I may. It's just a few lines, because otherwise <laughs> nobody memorizes it. Um, just a few lines. Okay. I, I have to, otherwise it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image of a spiritus mundi troubles my sight somewhere in sands of the desert. A shape with a lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun. And then he goes on, it's terrible, it's inverted. And he concludes, 20 centuries of, now I know, 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle and what rough beast its hour come round at last slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. That's a prophecy. And we all know this, and we understand it as a prophecy, as far as I'm concerned. It's not history, but we're familiar with this. And we know the sense in which it can be called true. And my question is whether that's what you were talking about. Okay, one more question, please go. Very quickly, and along the same lines, I'm wondering if we could bring the two papers together with this comparative point of apocalyptic literature. I was thinking at the beginning of Pelga's comments about Kitab al fitan and so a, a literature that's written after the fact as if it's a prophecy. And I'm thinking about Rashid ad-Din writing after the Mongol invasions. Perhaps he would push back against this a little bit, but then uh, in the case of tradition versus modernity and that rupture, thinking of this in terms of apocalyptic literature might be really productive as well. I think we, we need to begin answering. Um, you want to go ahead? Since you were asking. I would love but, to go ahead. I mean, yeah. just, I think or, or the, I mean, it's your choice really, but please. I, 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 I'll just pick up on the prophecy of history because I think, I, think I, I, I just wanted to put it out there because I think it's an important, uh, an, an interesting question. And I, I agree, I mean, we can, it's it's um, to to say that there's a continuity between them and that progress entails ideas of progress entails ideas of prophecy. I can see how we can we can argue that as well. But I, my thought was rather thinking about sort of the the movement of history, right? Um, so if you think about progress, you think in stages. Also. So you move from one <coughs> stage to the next. So if you think in, in terms of if the logic of history is a logical prophecy. It's not the logic of stages. It's the logic of prophecy and fulfillment or not fulfillment, which is, is a very different. I mean, I can see how the the evocation of the future can look similar, but if you look at it as as a temporal logic, it's just radically different. I think, and I think to discuss that those those differences, similarities, is just an interesting way of going into this this field that we're that we're in. <coughs> Um, yes, uh, phrases of from the Quran or from from uh, from also the the one that you cited in yes. particular with the first creation, the heaven and earth, which is Genesis one one. Well, this one he used specifically for his history to infuse it with some you know basis and theory that uh, that he then drafted on. Um, otherwise, he's he's uh, constantly using quotations from holy texts. I didn't know if it was something that you thought was significant or if he remarked on why the Bible is, as opposed to the Quran is a screaming device. Well, it has partially to do with where it, where it sits in the um, in his history. Uh, that's when he specifically speaks about not Muslims, but rather other parts of the of his history, but he is grafting his entire history on that. So that sounds significant. Um, the plurality and um, uh, situated <coughs> negative, um, negative universality, that I think is a very good way, that I would have to think about, but a very good way to frame what, that he nonetheless has a position himself, right? He is located somewhere. He's yes. located in space and time, and he's located in the Islamic environment, and that's where the calm, etc., comes from, that he's trying not to be polemic about it. Um, uh, so I think that would be a very good way to frame where, from where, from which vantage point um, he is writing it at the same time that he's letting each person speak with their own um, voice. 
in terms of apocalyptic um, literature, etc., somehow Rashid Adin is actually resolving a moment in time that happened before him. Mongol invasions are kind of, you know, the, the, the apex is 1258, uh, Mongol conquest of Baghdad, uh, execution of the caliph, uh, abolishment of the institution of the caliphate. Um, and we have about two to three generations of um, post Mongols who are ruling as Buddhists from the center of Islam, and which is supposedly something that should happen. Um, and we have no historians, right? We have really a vide historiographic, as um, as Jean Robin has called it. We have this moment of silence where nobody is writing, everybody is, is wondering what's happening. Uh, we have um, hadith, apocalyptic hadith during this time, um, uh, but nobody is, is, is kind of looking back. And then um, this, I've called it a break in history, if actually if not, uh, but that, um, that we have then at the time of Rashid al -Din, with Rashid al -Din, the absolute apex of all Persian historiography in all, in all time in, in you know, the last uh, uh, eight, nine hundred years, um, where people are actually coming back. Um, and what resolves this whole thing is, on the one end, you have this end of history, supposedly with the conquest of, of, of Baghdad, and then on the other end, you have the conversion of the Mongols to Islam around 1295. So they can then hark back to their own past, they can look back to their ancestors, and say, there were no Muslims yet, okay, they destroyed everything, but we are, yes, we are their heirs, but we are also no Muslims, and we actually make reforms. We reform the taxes, we reform the calendars, and all of that stuff. So basically, that permits people to all of a sudden write again about the past, and they're pouring it out. But it's post apocalyptic We have already kind of had that break. OK, I'll, I'll say uh, a bit about the apocalyptic literature also, in terms of Rungo Recito, uh, or in terms of the writing of Javanese history. I think a lot of the writing of Javanese history uh, you know, turns on 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 the recognition of of, of apocalypse, right? Of danger, of uh, of end times, and in one of the things that's really uh, kind of spectacular in uh, Rambo Rosita's poem, and that written right before his death, as the last of the prophetic po poets, was it really was <coughs> apocalyptic, in the sense that after Rambo Rosita, historians. Uh, in, in, in what became Indonesia, uh, came to live in a world that recognized the difference between history and prophecy. So history became the dead, and prophecy became prediction. Uh, in, uh, but, and yet, his poem lives, and it lives in Java today, and it flashes people back to that time when uh, <coughs> history was alive, and the future was alive in a way that it is not now. And I think this is one of the, the forces of his poetry. And having actually lived in an apop, 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 apocalyptic moment. Okay. We have time for another round. Huh. Right. Um, maybe I should let the gentleman ask the question, and then you can I, ask your question. OK. Mine's, mine's a quick question, and this is to Judith. And uh, when you were talking about trusted transmitters, mm -hmm. and this is the, 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 these were the works that he chose to, to gather. Uh, who was the judge of trust? How how was it evaluated? I mean, were, I mean it, it was you know, you're thinking of possibly isna type mm -hmm. questions, but that that's my question. Mm -hmm. um, and yours? Yeah. Yes. Yes, uh, my question is also for Judith. Uh, 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 as an Africanist, I'm very used to thinking about these questions of multiple temporalities in the context of uh, the colonial um, modes and other things, discussing the denial of communalness. Um, but reading your paper and particularly thinking about it alongside um, also Professor Fernow's paper, and I wonder if, if it's possible to think about typologies of, uh, to use. Um, Kind of held this terminology that uh, points on the kind of continuum between integration and, and morality, uh, with the ways in which different temporalities are, are managed, and to link those or to read them alongside the, the 
typologies of forms of imperial governance. And thinking about particularly the relationship between the way the Alcanate uh, imagines the relationship between integration and plurality as an act of governance and the way in which these different temporalities are being managed uh, uh, in this text. Any other questions? Yes, just And then the Talbio, OK? Actually, I think this is a question going somewhat similar to where Sean is going in with respect to um, feeding in from the above question and looking at the Japanese into, say, what Rashid al is doing. So could one say uh, that in some ways the calmness and the emotional register that you mark and that Helge points out in your paper with respect to this is actually precisely the indication of the absolute chaos over the, on the top of which he's sitting. Right, so the apocalyptic, if it's understood as a as a discursive thing, has already happened. But the actual empire that he is actually controlling, ruling, etc., it is precisely its extreme heterogeneity that has to be managed in you know, all kinds of ways that then requires this seemingly very calm history. So it would, I mean, this would then basically is kind of suggesting a. a, a a very kind of oppositional, symptomatic reading of Rashid Nadeem, rather than reading him from what, what he's actually saying. If we go quickly, I it's, will. But it's following up. Yeah. Um, Kayash? Yeah, I have just a very brief comment following from what Shrestad said. <laughs> so what I see in all these papers, and particularly in this panel, is you know the, the notion or the reality of crisis and history writing as a particular kind of reaction to a particular yeah. kind of crisis. So. I would like to say that this is one of the things that I hope we will, we will discuss more and more. As Shrestad was saying, I mean, in the case of Rashid ad-Din, really the crisis, <coughs> the shock of the Mongol invasions and all the attempts at making sense out of it. And in the case of Nancy, the shock of colonial modernity. Uh, and as far as I can see, the other papers are also discussing that. So what, what, what are the motivations, personal, cultural, political, behind history writing? So did this, this idea of, of, of a shock coming from outside the system to writing as a, as a response to that, I would like to you know deepen this discussion a little bit. And then, I very simplistically, where is the state in all of this? Is this about the success or failure of the state? Prophecy with the failure of the state and the success of the calm, perhaps. You know, where, you know, because the polity and history are generally very much connected. So it's very simplistic, but I think it should be discussed. And I'll let you ask, but I don't know if you'll get an answer. <laughs> I, I try to make it very brief. I mean, with the term universal history, I think what, what came up is the question of the master narrative that underlies your, your authors and the way they narrate their worlds, but also our way of looking at them. So, and uh, Nancy, you bring up this conflict between these different epistemologies of so-called, what, what, what came to be known then as traditional Japanese culture or knowledges and modern Western knowledge and regarding the conference theme of Islam in the, in the humanities like for me that raises the question what determines your and our place of speaking about these authors about for example this notion of time out of jointness which is a recurring theme in current debates on temporality um, and also on the notion of humanism that uh, for you Judith is you know your your, your project to bring out this humanist or what you call humanist moment in Rashid al -Din. and so what kind of, if we say what is universal history, you know, what determines then our way of de de defining universal history within a certain timeline, within a certain historicity that we establish in that moment, what, and what is the politics of, of that. Um, so to situate then Rashid al -Din as, you know, for, as an inventor or, you know, like within other historicities, like Islamic history or <coughs> universal history or human history. Yeah. Okay, um, we have about five minutes to uh, answer. <laughs> Do you want to say like one sentence each and then uh, we, we stop? Because I think these questions are going to be the questions of two days. So. Uh, briefly. Okay. I'll, I'll say one on, on sort of our place in thinking about these authors and these places and the issue of, of being calm or being engaged or passionate. Um, one of the reasons I wrote about this author in the way in which I did, uh, framing it with the destruction of Western modernity, uh, was an expression of my passion. Okay, and that was 
important to me in in my in my place was to 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 privilege something else and to actually perhaps imply that there were powers of the dying Roma Rosito that did this. Okay. I don't know if that answers your question, but any other thoughts on any other questions? Um, one more sentence. I'm not sure where the where the state is in all of this, mm -hmm. particularly in my. I mean, the, the, the state was involved in actually enforcing, <coughs> eventually enforcing these Western categories of you know, education and knowledge. But um, you know, there were several states. There was the, you know, there, there was also there was a continuing monarchy at the same time. Joseph, you wanna. Know? Chiming in with a shift of vantage point, um, and probably not very popularly. Well, actually, this was also written for the Mongols, right? Uh, it's not Rashid al-Din who just comes up with these things, but that's where the politics comes in. And so, so also the crisis, crisis uh, idea doesn't work, because um, it's always good to bring the crisis out of the head when something important happens. But in this case, the Mongols were actually quite happily in place, and they asked, and the first part of the history is about the history of the Mongols. They didn't want to forget. Actually, they did not want to forget. They wanted their own history to be written down. That's why the whole thing starts with the Mongols. It doesn't start with Adam and Eve and creation or anything. Um, so basically, uh, that's the one point. Um, but then, of course, uh, there are also multiple audiences. And Rashid Atin is not only writing it for the Mongols. It's also, and they wanted to, yes, um, they wanted to, of course, uh, know what is going on in that bigger, um, well, empire is perhaps not quite the right word, but that bigger entity that cousins of them were co-leading, um, co uh, co-directing, co-ruling in a corporate dynasty until a certain moment, until the moment when the ones of the Iranid, the moments of the Iranid converted to Islam, and they look at a much uh, smaller part. So looking at the big part when they have already, you know, already not so much part of it is also a conundrum for those who really work on this period for them, for whom it really small um, changes do matter. Um, the chaos reaction, again, one has to think about the vantage point and here I'm not thinking of, um, of the Mongol audience, but rather, for me, it's more of a reaction to a, an environment that's predominantly Islamic and where somebody who writes as a convert from Judaism or out of a Jewish family um, addressing issues in a world in which very quickly polemics can, can, can flare out of it. So for me, that's just as important as the, the chaos um, uh, thing. Chaos, again, we have to think for whom is it chaotic. For the Mongols, it's not chaotic, they move around. Uh, it's chaotic for those who are already there. So we always have to think about all um, uh, players uh, in that game, um, which comes back to this um, well, emotional register and uh, where one stands. But I think that's an important point. I think Thank you. I'll let Helga say his last word. My we began it, we can't yeah, that's it. That's going to be really, really short. I just wanted to emphasize the crisis element that I think is extremely important that I like to sort of to, to keep us keep discussing that. And But also it's it's interesting to see, so we have, we've discussed one very linear, although folded way of thinking history, which is the prophecy. Then we've been thinking about parallel histories. And the interesting thing is that they seem to be both linked to emotional registers, like the, the calmness that enables the parallel histories and, well, the manic prophecies, right? So the, <laughs> the, the manic, unlaconic, engaged linearity and the yeah. calm mm. possibility mm. Of, of parallel histories, mm. which just seems to be interesting to see yeah. how genres and ways of writing are linked to, to temporal and emotional registers. Great. 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 So coffee yeah. time. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>